The Last Judgment, Revelation, 2011-15. And I saw a throne, a great white one, and him who was sitting upon it, Jesus Christ. From his presence the earth and the heavens fled, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead both the great and the insignificant, standing in front of the throne. And books were opened, and another book was opened which is the book of life. And the dead were judged on the basis of the things written in the books, according to what they had done. For the sea gave up the dead which were in it, that is death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and each person was condemned according to what they had done. And death and Hades, all unbelievers, were cast into the lake of fire. And this is the second death. The lake of fire. And if anyone was not found written in the book of life, he was cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 2011-15. The verses here take us rapidly through all that remains of eschatology up until eternity begins. That is to say, they conclude God's plan for human history, with the exception of his blessed creation of the glorious new heavens and new earth, and the commencement of the eternal state, covered in Revelation chapters 21-22. The Great White Throne or Last Judgment, described previously as the final event before darkness, tears and sorrow fade into nothingness forevermore, washed away by the brilliant light of God in the everlasting kingdom of the Father where we believers shall enjoy sweet fellowship with Him and our Lord Jesus Christ, world without end. Following the melting away of the old heavens and earth, described in verse 11, the last phase of the resurrection will take place, wherein all millennial believers will be raised and rewarded with eternal life, while all the unsaved dead will be raised for the judgment and the second death. Since the theme of the book of Revelation is one of our Lord's just judgment upon the forces of evil and his total victory over them, it should not be surprising that these latter events, related elsewhere in scripture, give place here to the disposition of the unsaved in order to emphasize the last judgment itself. And there most certainly will be a last judgment of the unsaved debt, as the passage here makes clear, along with many other scriptures. For example Matthew 7 21 to 23, 16 25 to 27, Mark 8 35 to 38, Luke 9 24 to 26, Acts 24 25, etc. Every human being who attains adulthood with normal mental capacity is accountable to God for their free will choices, both their sins and their decisions, in regard to seeking out his mercy or failing to do so. Therefore, just as all are aware of God's existence and character, even if they later deny it or harden their hearts against this universal truth as noted in Romans 1.18-32, and as all are aware of their own mortality, so all are aware that successfully facing the scrutiny and judgment of a perfect God on one's own merits is an utterly impossible task. All unbelievers know that this last judgment is coming. The truly surprising thing to those of us who love Jesus Christ is the horrific folly of passively ignoring this problem or even actively rejecting God's grace when such things are true. The heavens recount the glory of God, and the firmament tells of the work of his hands. One day after another pours forth his words, and one night after another declares his knowledge. There is no tongue or culture that cannot understand their voice of the heavens' firmament. Their design has gone out into, is visible throughout, the entire earth, and their words to the end of the world. He has set a tent for the sun within them, hidden it in the heavens' firmament's night sky, and from this it goes forth like a resplendent bridegroom from his wedding canopy. The sun exults to run its course like an athlete does. Its starting line is at one end of the heavens, and its circuit takes it to the ends of the sky. And nothing is hidden from its view. Psalm 19:1-6. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. Ecclesiastes 3.11 God's wrath is about to be revealed from heaven upon all ungodliness and unrighteousness, on men who suppress the truth in their hearts about God and their unrighteousness. For that which can be known about God from everyday experience is obvious to them, because God has made it obvious. His nature, though invisible, is nevertheless plainly apparent, and has been since his foundation of the world, 
for it may be clearly inferred from this creation of his. This is true of both his eternal power and his divinity, so that they are without any excuse. They knew about God, but they neither honored him as God nor thanked him. Instead, they gave themselves over to the vanity of this world in their speculations, and their senseless hearts were filled with darkness. Claiming to be wise, they became foolish, for they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for images and likenesses of corruptible men, of birds and beasts and reptiles. For this very reason, God abandoned them to corruption in the lusts of their own hearts, that they might mutually defile their bodies, the very thing they lusted to do. And so they exchanged the truth of God for the lie of the devil, and worshipped and served the creature Satan in place of the Creator who is worthy to be blessed forever. Amen. Yes, for this very reason God abandoned them to defiling passions. For their females exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones, and likewise also the males abandoned natural relations with the female and burned with desire one for another, males for males, acting out their shamefulness in full, and in their own flesh, fully receiving the reward due for their error. And just as they did not see fit to keep God in their hearts, God abandoned them to their unfit minds, to do things which are not fitting. Filled up with every sort of unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder strife, guile, maliciousness, gossips, slanderers, God-forsaken and forsaking, insolent arrogant, boasters, divisors of evils, not concerned for their parents, unthinking, unreconcilable, uncaring, unmerciful, men who though they had full knowledge of God's righteous decree, namely, that those who do such things are worthy of death, not only did such things themselves, but even commended those who made it their practice to do them. Romans 1 32 For whenever the Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature the things written in the law these who have no law are a law for themselves. For they demonstrate that the essence of the law has been written in their hearts when their conscience testifies against them, and their mental deliberations based on conscience alternatively either condemn them or acquit them. This examination of Romans 2 11 to 15 will take place on the day when God will judge the secret things of men through Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. Romans 2 14 to 16. It is appointed unto men to die once, and, after that, judgment is in store. Hebrews 9 27. The destruction of the universe in the interlude of final judgment. The Last Resurrection of the Saved and the Unsaved At the end of the thousand-year millennial reign of Jesus Christ, there will be a complete cleansing of his threshing floor, the post-millennial complement to the Second Advent's baptism of fire in Mark 1.8, Matthew 3.10-12, and Luke 3.9-17. At this time all stumbling blocks will be removed from the Messiah's kingdom, and cast into eternal fire, in preparation for the commencement of the eternal kingdom, wherein there will be no evil or unbelief forevermore. A cleansing which requires a prior resurrection and judgment of the unsaved. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will sweep clean his threshing floor, and will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Matthew 3:12. The wheat are believers, the chaff unbelievers. Bringing the one group into the barn and burning up the other requires the prior resurrection of both and their individual evaluation, an evaluation for reward in the case of believers, but one of judgment for unbelievers. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which, when it was full, they drew to shore, and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 13 47-50 The end of the age is the end of human history, coterminous with the end of the millennium. As in the case of John's analogy to the threshing floor, saving the good fish and throwing out the bad requires their prior resurrection represented by the collecting of all who remain at the end of the age by the net and general evaluation, represented by the fishermen who examine the fish to determine their category, good or bad. 
This initial separation into two essential categories, accomplished by angels in the passage here, is also represented in the sheep and goats judgment, where the Lord will separate the two groups prior to their specific individual judgment in Matthew 25:31 to 33. The parable of the net also places the disposition of the wicked last in the order of these final events. They are thrown into the fiery furnace, the lake of fire, only after the righteous have been collected. Thus in this passage we have the same sequence as implied by the sheep and goats judgment, John the Baptist's description, and our context Revelation 2011-15. Resurrection of both groups, all as yet non-resurrected believers along with all the unsaved from the beginning of human history. Separation by group, wheat from chaff, sheep from goats, good from bad fish. Salvation and evaluation of the righteous. Judgment and final disposition of the unrighteous into the lake of fire. Furthermore, we know from Revelation 20:11b, from his presence the earth and the heavens fled, and no place was found for them, that before the last judgment the old heavens and old earth will be destroyed in 2 Peter 3 5 13. Revealing everything that transpired in all prior history in 2 Peter 3:10 and that it is only after the completion of this entire process that the new heavens and new earth will be created and eternity will thus begin, referenced in Revelation 21.1. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Matthew 13 24-30 and 13 36-43. The parable of the weed and the tares, weeds, presents an identical sequence of events, only somewhat more detailed. The kingdom of heaven is the Messiah's millennial kingdom as noted in Matthew 13:47 wherein unbelievers, tares, weeds, grow up in close proximity to believers, wheat. The harvest is the resurrection, step one, wherein the weeds are separated from the wheat and are prepared for but not committed to the fire, step two. The righteous are gathered into the barn, step three, and the wicked are then cast into the lake of fire following the last judgment, step four. Finally, this parable adds the additional detail of showing us the righteous after the conclusion of this entire four-step process, now enjoying life everlasting in the eternal state in the kingdom of their father, the new heavens and new earth as opposed to the kingdom of heaven, the prior millennial kingdom. 4. Given that we know from our context in Revelation chapters 21 and 22 that the father will only be present on earth after human history has concluded, the kingdom of their father, mentioned here as the place where the righteous will shine like the sun, must certainly be the eternal kingdom of New Jerusalem. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, after that millennial reign, 
and he will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat, I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink, I was a stranger, and you invited me in, I needed clothes and you clothed me, I was sick and you looked after me, I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty, and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat, I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink, I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in, I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me, I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison, and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Matthew 25 31-46 The sheep and goats judgment agrees with this sequence entirely. Verse 31 encompasses the final events of human history from the second advent, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, to the last judgment, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. With the throne referring to the throne of judgment whereon our Lord Jesus will render a final evaluation of reward for all remaining believers, the sheep, and of judgment for all unbelievers, the goats. The phrase, and when all the angels are with him, is an additional indication that the judgment upon which this description focuses is post-millennial, as there are no indications from elsewhere in scripture that the angels will play a visible role in Christ's millennial kingdom. Further, the fact that all the angels are present implies that the fallen angels have now been removed from the scene, an event which takes place at the millennium's close. In this description too there is a separation of the righteous and the wicked, with the righteous receiving their evaluation first, and the wicked last, which evaluation is followed by their sequestration into the lake of fire. Finally, here too we see believers enjoying eternity at the end of the process, in contrast to the prior damnation experienced by unbelievers. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. As suggested under step 1, this process of rewarding the millennial believers and judging all unbelievers requires the prior resurrection of all remaining non-resurrected human beings, the final phase of the resurrection unto life on the one hand, and the joint resurrection of all the unsaved dead on the other. This resurrection is in fact the very last earthly event of human history, and a point equally important to emphasize, since it underlines the reality of the eternal consequences of our choices in this life, and the eternal divergence between the two essential elements of the human race, based upon these choices. Namely, eternal life for all who respond to Jesus Christ, and the second death for all who refuse the grace of God in, Matthew 10:34. For many who sleep in the dust will awake, some to eternal life, but the others to shame and eternal separation from God. Then those who have insight will shine like the shining forth of the dawn, even those who led the many to righteousness, like stars forever and ever. Daniel 12 2-3 Just as the Father raises the dead and brings them to life, so the Son brings to life whomever he wishes. And neither does the Father judge anyone but he has given all judgment to the Son, in order that all may honor the Son as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly I say to you, that the one who hears my word and believes in the one who sent me has eternal life and does not enter into judgment, but is passed from death into life. Truly, truly I say to you that an hour is coming when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear it will come to life. 
For just as the Father has life in himself, so he has given to the Son to have life in himself. And he has given authority to him to render judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this statement that an hour will come in which all those in their tombs will hear his voice. For they shall come forth, those who have done what is good to a resurrection of life, those who have faithfully followed Jesus Christ, but those who have done what is worthless to a resurrection of judgment. John 5 21-29 And I have the same hope in God as these men, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. Acts 24 15 The Destruction of the Present Heavens and Earth Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment, as a vesture shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. Psalm 102 26 and cross-referenced with Hebrews 1 11 to 12. Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth will quake from its place, on account of the anger of the Lord, and on the day of his fierce wrath. Isaiah 13 13 and cross-reference with Haggai 2 6, 2 21. All the stars of the heavens will be dissolved, and the sky rolled up like a scroll, all the starry host will fall like withered leaves from the vine, like shriveled figs from the fig tree. Isaiah 34 4 and cross-reference with Matthew 24 29 and Mark 13 24 to 25. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, look at the earth beneath, the heavens will vanish like smoke the earth will wear out like a garment, and its inhabitants die like flies. But my salvation will last forever, my righteousness will never fail. Isaiah 51 6. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Matthew 24 35 and cross reference, Matthew 5 18, Mark 13 31, and Luke 21 33. See to it that you do not ignore the one who is speaking to you. For if those of the Exodus generation did not escape when they ignored the one who was giving them warning from the earth, Moses, how much more shall we not escape if we turn away from the one giving us warning from heaven? His voice shook the earth at that time at Mount Sinai, but now he has made us this promise, saying, Yet once more shall I shake not only the earth, but also heaven in Haggai 2.6 and Haggai 2.21. And this, once more, clearly indicates the coming transformation of things which may be shaken as things which have been made by him, so that the coming things which cannot be shaken may abide forever. Since, therefore, we have received a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude, so that through it, we may serve God in a pleasing way with reverence and fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12:25-29. And the heaven retreated like a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and hill was moved from its place. Revelation 6 14. And I saw a throne, a great white one, and him who was sitting upon it, Jesus Christ. From his presence the earth and the heavens fled, and no place was found for them. Revelation 20 11. As the passages here show, the removal of the present cosmos is an essential prerequisite for the commencement of eternity and precedes the creation of the new heavens and new earth, which will be the home of all believers and elect angels forevermore. The reason for their removal is the necessity to remove every taint of sin and unrighteousness, and, as befits such a judgment, the precise manner of their removal will be a fiery destruction in Hebrews 12:29. And the present heavens and earth have been reserved for fire by that same word, of God preserved for the day of judgment, and the destruction of godless men. Let not this one fact escape your attention then, beloved, namely that one day is like a thousand years in the Lord's eyes, and a thousand years like one day, that day, will span a millennium. The Lord is not delaying in the fulfillment of his promise, as some think, rather he is exercising patience for your sake being unwilling for anyone to perish, but desiring all instead to come to repentance. For the day of the Lord will come like a thief, a day in, over the course of, which the heavens will depart with a roar, the very elements will ignite and dissolve, and the earth and everything which has been done upon it will be laid bare for the Lord's inspection. 
Since all these things are destined to disintegrate in this way, consider what sort of Christians we ought to be, devoted to holy and godly conduct, as we wait with eager expectation and apprehension, the advent of the day of God. For on that day the heavens will burst into flame and dissolve, and the elements will catch fire and melt. But we are awaiting new heavens and a new earth, just as he promised a world where righteousness dwells. 2 Peter 3 7-13 the fact that the present heavens and earth have been preserved for the day of judgment and the destruction of godless men in verse 7. And cross-reference with Matthew 24 35-36, Mark 13 31-32, and 1 Peter 4 5-6 indicates the same sequence of events. The destruction of the universe will precede the last judgment, which judgment will in turn precede the creation of the new heavens and new earth. Therefore the last judgment must take place in a sort of brief interim between time and eternity, occurring after the final resurrection of the living and the dead, and the annihilation of the present cosmos, but before the creation of the new heavens and new earth, and the commencement of eternity. The Judgment of the Sheep Since the last judgment of Revelation chapter 20 occurs in an interval or interim period between the end of time, following the resurrection and the destruction of the old heavens and earth described in Revelation 20 b. But before the beginning of eternity, prior to the creation of the new heavens and new earth described in Revelation 21 1. And since the sheep and goats are judged sequentially and in the same venue in Matthew chapter 25. We conclude that the final evaluation of the friends of the bride, that is, all who are saved from the point of Christ's return until the end of human history, also takes place during this interlude. This is the final phase of the resurrection of the living prophecy by the Apostle Paul. But each will be resurrected in his own echelon. Christ is the first fruits, the initial person and echelon of resurrection. Next will be those belonging to Christ at his coming, all believers at the second advent. Then the end of human history, the resurrection of millennial believers, when he will hand the kingdom over to the Father, after he has brought an end to all rule, all power and all authority, hostile human and angelic control. For he must rule until he has placed all his enemies under his feet. 1 Corinthians 15 23-25 that the sheep are evaluated first, as we saw previously and see also, 1 Peter 4.17, where judgment is said to begin with the household of faith, and only afterwards descend upon those who do not obey the gospel, is also established plainly enough by Matthew 25.31-46. For the sheep on his right hand are commended first in verses 34-40. And only after their evaluation are the goats judged in verses 4145. Moreover, the evaluation of the sheep for reward is completed before the goats are judged, explaining the absence of believers at the great white throne, which will be covered in the next video in the Last Things of Logos playlist. This evaluation will be precisely along the lines of the evaluation of the church at Christ's second advent return, it is only the timing which will be different. Before moving on to the last judgment of all unbelievers, two common misunderstandings about this final evaluation of resurrected believers must be addressed. First, Matthew 25:46 does not in any way conflict with the fact that only unbelievers are seen before the great white throne in Revelation 20:11:15. The righteous have already been evaluated, and so of course, go off into eternal life. Nothing in Matthew 25 46 necessitates either that the sheep should have to wait until the goats are condemned to experience eternal life, or far less that they must thus be included in the judgment described at Revelation 20 11, 15. The sheep have already received their rewards before the judgment of the goats, the great white throne, even begins, as is abundantly clear from the entire prior description in Matthew chapter 25. Verse 46 merely summarizes the contrasting destinies of the two groups, rather than rewriting the chronological sequence. Secondly, attempts to equate the sheep and goats' judgment with Christ's second advent, rather than seeing it for what it truly is, the final evaluation of the last echelon of resurrected believers and the last judgment of all unbelievers, are misguided for several reasons. 1. 
The phrases, blessed of the Father, and the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world, in verse 34, are clear references to the eternal state, rather than the millennial kingdom of Christ. For the Father will not make his abode with us on earth until the end of human history as noted in Revelation 21.3, 21.22. Therefore, rather than the thousand-year kingdom of heaven, in time, Christ's millennial kingdom. Contrast in Matthew 13.24 and 13.43 respectively. It is the Father's permanent kingdom in eternity which these phrases clearly have in mind in 1 Corinthians 15.25-28, Hebrews 12.28, and Hebrews 8.2. 2. The sheep and goats are judged at the same venue and sequentially, and the unbelievers are thrown into the lake of fire immediately at the conclusion of the process of judgment. This only happens following the conclusion of human history in Revelation 2014-15. 3. The righteous go off into eternal life at the conclusion of their judgment, a condition which, while we believers do possess it positionally now, and will have it experientially from the point of our departure to be in the Lord's presence. And bountifully from the time of our resurrection, is only truly descriptive of our ultimate status, once eternity begins not from the commencement of the millennium, but from the beginning of eternity proper. 4. The separation of a single mixed group into two entirely discrete groups, of believers and unbelievers, is only paralleled in descriptions of the end of history, the wheat and the tares of Matthew 13 24 to 30, and the good and the bad fish of Matthew 13 47 to 50. It is no doubt because of the overall theme of the book of Revelation, that is, its focusing on God's judgment upon evil and his defeat of the devil, his minion Antichrist, and the wicked in general, that we do not find our context providing all of the other details about this final evaluation of the millennial believers, details which, in any case, are available to us from elsewhere in scripture, as we have just observed. Thank you for listening. On screen you will find the last things of logos in which this video is a part of as well as other playlist that may be beneficial to your spiritual growth. Please like comment, share, subscribe and click the bell for more content. May God bless you and yours with peace, love, grace and empathy.